So uh, you are in the right place if you are looking for integrating um, traditional indigenous knowledges into adaptation planning. Um, thank you for joining us and please feel free to ask questions, put it in the chat box. Um, I think we have, I don't know if you guys have raised the raise your hand ability so we can do that. We'd really love to hear what you have to say and um, have you contribute to the discussion. So Kelsey, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, without with our team here at the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, um, ITEP for short, I Nikki Cooley um, co-managed a program with my uh, co-manager Karen Cosetto. She's based out of Boulder, Colorado, but I, we could not do it with an amazing team. Most of them aren't here. They may join us a little bit later, but we have Anne Marie Chischilly, our executive director. Dar Marks Marino, who also works for the National Tribal Air Association, uh, Julie Maldonado, one of our collaborators, uh, facilitators from the Lichen Network. So L-I-K-E-N, if you have a chance to check her out, they do amazing stuff. Um, and also she's the one of the facilitators of the Rising Voices Workshop. Um, so if you don't know what that is, check it out. It's a great gathering they do every year. Uh, also, our admin assistant, Lorene Lewis, keeps us in check. Um, but I wanted to introduce myself before I tell us, Colleen and uh, Kelsey, to introduce themselves. But uh, I wanted to do it in the, in the Navajo way, Diné way. So this is how we do it um, in our language. So, look at the is so I'm of the Tyrant House clan. I'm born for the Reed People clan, my father's clan, or our father's clan. And then my paternal grandfather is from the Many Goats clan. Maternal grandfathers are from the um, Water That Flows Together clan. And we come from Shanto and Blue Gap, Arizona. So they're in uh, northern, northern central Arizona. And uh, I work out of Flagstaff, Arizona um, with I, the ITEP team. Um, so I'm really honored to be here. And I always introduce myself in the Navajo way because it's respectful to our ancestors, but also respectful to any relatives we may have in the room. Um, whether they're from another tribe or within the tribe, but also we are acknowledging our non-human relatives who can hear us. Um, so it's really important that we also acknowledge them through our um, our introductions and whatnot. So with that, I'll pass it over to Kelsey and then Colleen to introduce themselves real quickly. Thanks so much, Nikki. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Morales, and I am tuning in today from the traditional homelands of the Kootenai, the Penorial, and the Bitterroot Salish tribes, so um, from Whitefish, Montana, and usually I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I am the Senior Community Program Coordinator with ITEP's Tribes and Climate Change Program, so welcome, and I'll go ahead and pass it to Colleen. Thank you, Kelsey. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colleen Cooley, and I am one of the research specialists with the ITIP Tribes and Climate Change Program. And I'm tuning in from Shanto in Northern Arizona on the Navajo Nation. Thanks. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Colleen and I have the same clan, so I basically said the clan for both of us. Um, but if you have a chance, please introduce yourself. Um, Omar uh, bravely did so. If you want to, um, go ahead and put it in the chat box um, uh, or unmute. I'd love to, we'd love to hear your voice. Um, while we're next, go ahead and go to the next slide, um, Kelsey. 
All right. So yesterday, if you were on the um, ITEP uh, 101 training uh, workshop on the adapt uh, introduction to adaptation planning, you saw this um, framework that we have up here, and we're kind of basing that, base our discussion off of this. And this is that framework that um, guides people on how to write their adaptation plan. Um, so uh, it's kind of like the different steps and there's a lot of steps that are out there, a lot of frameworks and whatnot. So this is just one of them, but I think what makes this really unique, um, it was one of the first frameworks that really introduced traditional knowledge. Um, and it was also based on the thinking of how tribes and indigenous people work because um, they are sovereign nations. So they have their own governments and they work very uniquely depending on their size, but also their location. Um, so Navajo Nation is 17 million acres, um, approximately 17 million acres with about 350,000 tribal members, um, less live on the reservation. Um, as opposed to Blue Lake Rancheria, Northern California, they're really small, but they are um, one of the strongest governments that really supports climate adaptation planning. So they kind of get things done a little bit faster. Um, they do a lot of tribal engagement and so does Navajo, but it takes a little bit longer. So I'm trying to show you the, uh, the difference in the size of um, tribes and how they get things done. Um, if you're just joining us, we're just getting started. Go ahead and let us know where you're from in the chat box, in the Zoom chat box. And we can also check in the Pathable uh, chat box too. Um, so the planning process really engages tra traditional knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledge. We emphasize that all the way around because it's a really important part of indigenous culture. And um, it's also engaging community members that really don't have that title or need that title of environmental director, climate change coordinator, and so on. It's grandma and grandpa. It's my mom who is a sheep herder and a weaver. You know, you're really um, involving the community. So we, um, uh, we really emphasize traditional knowledge. Um, and, and on the next slide, I'm going to talk about, um, this is kind of what the, the phase goes through, scoping the plan. We talked about that yesterday, um, assessing your strengths and your weaknesses, determining options and actions, implement and monitor, evaluate and adjust. And throughout all of these, you one of your, you know, you can, one of the things that can be, um, said as, as one of your strengths is that you have traditional knowledge is a big component of your plan. So for example, the Yurok tribe in Northern California, they have a cultural committee um, and they also have an elder committee and they their plan heavily depends on what the elders say, what the elders have observed in the, cha uh, the changes, um, the improvements and what needs to be done. So they have like a whole data set um, uh, in the elder knowledge right there. So that's a strength of theirs. And for some people that could be a weakness because of the dying languages or their elders, um, the knowledge holders aren't as present as they used to be. So, um, so that's just what that is. And so on the next slide, um, oh, actually go ahead and go back to the next slide. Sorry, the, the, the previous slide. So here, before I pass it on to Kelsey, I just really wanna mention that this is just one way, uh, a few ways that you can insert traditional knowledge into your planning process because it's respectful to um, tribal members that are in your community. Uh, that may be in your community or definitely in your community, excuse me. But also if you're working with a tribe, this is one thing that you really want to acknowledge as being as a, a really important part of who they are, recognizing that. And there are many wrongs. Um, we don't have, that's a whole nother ses session. Um, but also um, the, right, the right thing to do is really ask the traditional knowledge holders for permission to use their knowledge in the process. And so uh, I'll pass it over to Kelsey, but I want you to think about that while Kelsey and Colin are talking um, with that. So uh, go ahead, Kelsey, um, I'll hand it over to you. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Nikki. Um, again, welcome everyone. And 
You know, we, we really want this session to be interactive and um, an opportunity for, for all of us to share and, and learn from one another. And so if you're able to, we'd love for you to turn your video on if, if your connectivity allows. Um, but we wanna start off today's session by having you all describe what traditional and indigenous knowledges means to you using your senses. And so, you know, what does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Um, what does it feel like? You know, um, these different senses and, and you know, kind of we kind of want this you to take this question in whatever way makes sense to you. Um, so yeah, please uh, unmute and, and share. We'll just do a quick share out. Um, and, or write your responses in the chat box here. And yeah, we really want to do some framing of what traditional knowledge is. Um, I think often in climate adaptation work, uh, you know, it's, it seems to be unknown, but, um, you know, that's not always the case. So we want to define that uh, before we really dive into today's content. Tyler, do you want to talk? I'm going to pick on you because I know you <laughs> and you have, you're unmuted. <laughs> I didn't even know I was unmuted. <laughs> I, I got funny. an eye on you. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> At least I have my video off. Not anymore. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to describe it because I can't, I can't speak to it the way um, probably many of the people can um, that are part of the session, but I guess something that strikes me when we do are able to talk with, um, you know, at least members of the bands that we serve is it's a lot of it's what they feel. Um, and there's a really authentic, there's a authenticity when they, when they speak to you about things that are important to them and changes that they've seen. Um, so I guess I'd just throw that out there is it's something you can just tell there's such an emotional connection and a, a feel that they have for um, what they're sharing with you. Um, so yeah, I would say feeling would be one. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Tyler. And yeah, I realize, you know, not all folks on this call, um, including myself, may not be coming from tribal communities and, and that's okay. Um, Thanks for being brave, Tyler, and, and kind of putting that out there. So very open to, to what others think. Colleen, if you, if you have anything, feel free. No, I was just going to say, I don't think you need to be a tribal member to describe it or talk about it. I mean, you're here for a reason. So we want to hear from you before we start giving that information to you. So... Uh, just like if we were meeting in person, and that's why we we're encouraging you to show your videos if you can. Uh, please, we want to hear from you first before we, you know, go into some slides. <laughs> Anyone, even put it in the chat. We want to hear what you think about traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, native knowledge, anything. There's no right or wrong answer. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Hi there, uh, I'm Thomas Bonner from the Univers University of Missouri. Um, thank you for putting this on. Um, I'm excited to, to be a part of this. Uh, to, you know, to answer your question, I, I'm not a tribal member, um, but I'm trying to find a way to identify with this question and, and kind of look back on my experiences. And as it relates to climate change, um, to me, traditional knowledge is, is I agree with the, the previous speaker that it's, it's kind of a feeling it's a sense that some things have changed. That's what stands out to me the most. Uh, for example, um, you know, the phenology or the green up in the springtime, that is something where I don't have specific data or numbers on, but I just feel like things are happening sooner. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just one example. It seems like there are a lot of situations where we can tell or I can feel that something isn't quite the same 
but I don't ha I haven't measured it, but there is a concern there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin? Hi, thanks. Yes, and I'm afraid I don't have, um, my husband's using our webcam, so I can't turn on my video, uh, but I am not a tribal member. I am a, an ecologist, trained ecologist, and I, um, when I think of uh, with the knowledge that I often bring to a natural setting, it ends up reducing the elements to um, to data points, uh, or to you know it's this plant it, um, or this uh, you know this tree it, and I, I don't often think about the um, or it's it's easy to reduce something into sort of simple categories that fit tightly onto a um, into sort of a, a data framework, and so I um, am seeking to learn more about traditional ecological knowledge in a way that I perceive it to be perhaps more expansive than the kind of, um, and more inclusive and not sort of ob objectifying um, th than I think often my own practice ends up being as a, as a quantitative ecologist. Great, thanks so much, Caitlin. Yeah, that's, that's really, um, that's a great point to share. Uh, often in the work that we're doing, you know, that there, there seems to be this disconnect from, from the world and beings around us. And so, um, yeah, thanks. Appreciate you for making that point. Any other folks want to share how traditional knowledge sits with them? All right, we'll go ahead and keep going. So Colleen, I've got slides for you and... Yeah, I just want to mention what, I don't know if anybody attended Robin Wall Kimmer's um, opening uh, speaking engagement this morning, but I think she describes a lot of it really well um, and how the plants, you know, are our teachers and um, that we can learn a lot from them. And so when I'm thinking about traditional knowledge, there's a lot of things that come up. Uh, I think Nikki mentioned some of it. Our mother is a weaver. So I think about that and passing that knowledge down, um, whether it's orally or written. Uh, so that kind of speaks to me. Uh, just a smell of the wool. I think um, that's traditional knowledge, I think, and carrying that forward. Uh, so again, feel free to put it in the chat box. We want to hear from you and get, uh, get your participation in this uh, session. Go ahead, Kelsey. So what is traditional knowledge? I think we can all agree that no universal, universal definition exists because we all are coming from uh, different upbringings, uh, different ways of learning, and different knowledge systems. And so uh, some of the other terms that are used to describe, you know, traditional knowledge or where maybe you have read about it um, and other people refer it to as are these other knowledge systems. So indigenous or native or TEK, you know, IK, um, maybe those are some of the terms that you have heard. Uh, so again, um, no, there's no right or wrong answer. Go ahead, Kelsey. Uh, just a little bit more about traditional knowledges. And some of this information is coming from a guidelines that were guidelines that were put together uh, for considering traditional knowledges and climate change initiatives. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit uh, about the authors and the purpose, and we'll provide a link in a chat box as well. Um, so I think you can also refer to as knowledge or knowledges, knowledges <laughs> in a plural sense, because um, each tribe or each community has their own way of describing this or including it in possibly their climate adaptation plans or any initiatives that, oh, 
Kelsey, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is kind of just different ways of um, thinking about traditional knowledges. So again, it's uh, interrelated, intergenerational. Um, as I mentioned, it can be expressed orally through language stories um, and songs or just other ways. You, you guys can see this slide here. So um, I think there's different ways of looking at this. Go ahead, Kelsey. I think the other thing to be aware of is sharing the knowledge. So I think um, these guidelines that we'll get into in a little bit kind of talk about, speak to that. Um, you know, when you're sharing information about traditional knowledges or stories, really obtaining that permission or working directly with the tribes where you're obtaining that information from, I think uh, just being aware of the risk of sharing that information too. So um, kind of being sensitive to, to those stories um, and those knowledge, um, the knowledge that is being shared, right? So I think in the past and previously, you know, I think a number of research researchers um, and scientific papers that have come out might speak to some of these uh, the information being shared, uh, maybe for their own use or benefit. Uh, and so I think sometimes tribes and communities can be a little hesitant, right, of sharing some of this information. For example, you know, place names. I think that's one area where um, some tribes might be hesitant in sharing because they want to keep that within their own tribe and not necessarily share that uh, with the public. So uh, just being mindful of what, how you're sharing it and obtaining uh, you know, permission before doing so. Go ahead. So uh, there are some guidelines and I want to acknowledge the authors that put this together. Um, I don't know if Kelsey or Nikki can put uh, yep, Nikki, if you can put the, the, the title and also the link in there. So the authors of these and the working group that came together to put together these guidelines include our very own ITEP Executive Director, Anne-Marie Chishchilly, along with other collaborators, collaborators uh, Carletta Chief, Mike Derglow Jr., Gary Morishima, Daniel Wildcat, who we heard from yesterday, and others, um, and basically putting together the guidelines to increase understanding of the role and protections for traditional knowledges in climate initiatives, and also providing provisional guidance to those engaging in efforts that encompass traditional knowledge and lastly, increase mutual beneficial and ethical interactions between tribes and non-tribal partners. And so it's, I think this publication, as you read through it, is meant to be an informal resource for tribes, agencies, organizations in understanding uh, traditional knowledge systems in the concept of climate change, right? So it's meant to inspire dialogue and questions and foster opportunities for indigenous peoples and non-indigenous partners to braid, I guess, weave together both Western science and traditional knowledge in a culturally appropriate uh, manner um, and also um, tribally led uh, initiatives. So the first guideline uh, is understanding the key concepts, right? We kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, who are the knowledge holders? How are they relevant to climate change and air quality? What are those knowledge, you know, knowledge? Um, what is that information with, you know, uh, what, what, what is it, you know, basically just understanding it to, before you get started. Okay, next slide. And 
the second guideline is, you know, I mean, you can read it here. I don't want to read it word for word, um, but recognizing that Indigenous peoples and the holders of traditional knowledge have a right not to participate in federal interactions around TK. So, you know, not really when you're working with tribal partners um, and Indigenous peoples around this, um, I think we we may mention it over and over is just being mindful of you know not forcing the the communities to to, to participate um, and that they can withdraw their participation at any time. I think because some of the information again is just really sensitive um, in how it is being used um, in different spaces. Um, and that goes into the third guideline is understanding and communicating the risk for the indigenous peoples and holders of these knowledges. So um, it goes a little bit more deeper in the, the guidelines um, if you want to, to access that. Um, but I think if Nikki, if you wanna chime in anywhere uh, with these guidelines, um, that, would be, that would be fine as well. Um, Sure. Um, uh, let me say, I just want to say something really quick about this too, is that a lot of us are researchers from academic institutions or we want to work with researchers and many of them may be non-native. Um, and it's really important that um, they, we and they recognize these guidelines when you're going into a community and asking for this information, which they're not willingly um, giving up because, um, you know, just because you say research doesn't mean that um, it's going to be beneficial to them. So you have to, you have to really give them, make sure you, you give them um, that role that they have that power over their own information and how it's used and whatnot. You're, you know, I'm the guest. If I go into um, you know, Ojibwe territory, I'm not going to be accepted just because I'm Navajo, I'm indigenous, I'm, I'm still an outsider. So we got to, you know, so I just want to mention that about the guidelines. So pa I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Just because we're native, it doesn't mean that we are already have an in, right? Um, even within my own tribe, Navajo Nation, I've been to other communities that I'm not necessarily from there um, and still have to be sensitive to the information that I might want to obtain from them or that they want to share with me and just being careful in how that is being shared back uh, with other, other researchers or initiatives um, within that project. So go ahead, Kelsey. So guideline four, um, establishing an institutional interface between indigenous peoples, knowledge holders and government for clear, transparent and culturally appropriate terms of reference. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, goes deeper into having clear and transparent communication with the federal agencies and researchers. Um, I think just basically just being open, transparent, transparent and honest um, with each other through this process and not, you know, trying to hide certain types of information or what's going to happen with that information, uh, depending on the, the initiative that is being led. I know I'm going through this kind of quickly, but I wanted to, Kelsey to have some time to go into some examples that she found. So um, guideline five and six are outlined here, uh, providing training for federal agency staff. You know, I think that could be done even before going into a project where you're gonna be obtaining some information around traditional knowledge um, and also providing directions to agency staff, researchers, and non-Indigenous non entities and ensure that protections for traditional knowledge requested by tribes and knowledge holders are upheld. So also following through with, with what's gonna happen 
with that knowledge. Recognizing the role of multiple knowledge systems, which I mentioned at the beginning, um, I think even within tribes or even within Navajo Nation, just because we're such a large uh, tribe, we also have different stories um, and ways that we were taught uh, or you know, stories that were told to us. Uh, so we don't all view the same thing or view things the same way. Uh, we, you know, have different experiences as well. So just not making the assumption that, that one tribe is the same. We're very diverse in our, our knowledge systems as well. And I believe this is the last guideline. Uh, developing guidelines for review of grant proposals that recognize the value of traditional knowledges while ensuring protections for um, TKs, Indigenous peoples, and holders of TKs. So again, I don't want to read through it <laughs> here for you, uh, word for word, but you can uh, go to the link that Nikki shared uh, in the chat box and you can read a little bit more further into to what these guidelines mean. All right, Kelsey, I think it's, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Colleen. Nikki, um, if you have anything else that you wanted to add with, for the guidelines, um, you know, we can definitely go into that or save it for, for after. Um, you can save it for after. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm okay. dying to hear from you. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. So, um, so we picked, we pulled one of the climate change adaptation plans, and this one is from the Saint Regis Mohawk tribe um, from the from the New York region. And um, yeah, so basically, you know, I pulled out pieces that I thought were really interesting and unique to this plan. Um, the link to the actual plan is here on this slide. And so maybe Nikki, if you could drop that into the chat, that would be great. And yeah, I encourage you all to click that and kind of follow along um, with me. Uh, you know, screenshots don't really do this plan justice and also scrolling through um, is not very engaging. So um, yeah, definitely follow along with me and I'll kind of point you out to the different pages. But um, you know, two things that, that stick out about this plan right off the bat um, is the organization um, through traditional and culturally sacred beings. And I'll show you what I'm talking about on, the, on this next slide here. And also the structure around traditional knowledge. So just in general, how, um, <clears throat> how each section is structured. And so I've got some screenshots here. So um, the screenshot here on the left is just of the table of contents. And you can see, you know, that they're not just talking, you know, like instead of saying agriculture, uh, the St. Regis Mohawk tribe is talking about three sisters or, you know, medicinal herbs, animals, and trees, for example, instead of saying forestry, they're talking about trees. Um, and so I really thought that, you know, this is really interesting um, in a beautiful way to, to write one's climate adaptation plan. And, um, yeah, here on the right hand side of this screen is just an example of basically how the chapters are set up. And so you've got, you've got, you know, the, the subject area um, at the top, and then there is a quote um, from the tribes, you know, and then uh, there below that, you know, kind of going into the significance of, you know, whatever this being element is, and then it goes into, I'm going to jump back here really quick. Um, it goes into the current conditions of, of Mother Earth, for example. Uh, it then goes into what happens to Mother Earth with the, with, with the future of climate change. And then um, going into the ongoing and planned climate change adaptation action. And so that's really what I'm going to focus on moving forward forward in the plan is picking out um, some 
an element that is culturally significant and then kind of going into some of the unique mitigation actions that that surround that area. And so, okay, so to kick us off um, the fish. So if, you, if you're following along um, in this climate adaptation plan, uh, this is gonna be in, on page 15. And so, um, you know, just, I pulled some quotes in terms of, you know, how the St. Regis Mo Mohawk tribe um, really values fish and, and how it's integrated in, into their culture and life way. And so, um, you know, the fish continue to carry on their original instructions from the creator and cleanse and purify the water and gives themselves as sustenance to the people, bird life and wildlife. And so you're gonna, you know, that language is very different than, you know, a technical climate adaptation um, type written report. And, and honestly, when I went through this, uh, you know, it was more engaging. You could feel, um, you know, just what is an important to, to this tribe and, and why it's important and how it's important and how it's, and how it's been um, impacted by climate change. And so um, if you scroll down further, um, it, within this section, it goes into the mitigation actions. And so some of the, the mitigation actions in place are to reintroduce the lake sturgeon and also the Atlantic salmon, um, both of which are, are, are fish that the tribe has fished for, for forever since their existence um, and that are now going extinct. And so finding ways to keep these fish populations alive and, and thriving. And so another area, um, if you keep scrolling in that plan, uh, on page 19, um, we get into the small plants and grasses. And so again, you know, at the top, you've kind of got a similar quote to, to how fish were framed. Um, but these small plants and grasses, um, so the culture of this tribe includes basket making. And so sweet grass is picked in July for making baskets, grating, and it's also used as incense, right? So it's kind of getting into how these plants and grasses um, fuel the life ways of the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. Um, and so a unique mitigation action strategy here are that some of their grant funding is being used to teach teenagers within the community how to make some of their um, traditional traditional foods and, um, you know, moccasins, feather fans, rattles, uh, water drums, and um, other homemade food and things that, that were used long ago. And so, you know, it's, it's maintaining um, these traditional practices and, and trying to pass them on to the youth. And that was extremely uh, relevant in, in the plan itself. Berries was also a really interesting section. So going on to page 21. Um, so again, another similar introduction to the past, uh, to the past areas that I was talking about. Um, and you know, it's it's signifying that the strawberry is the leader of the berries, and it's used in ceremonies and with with food and drink. And so some of the mitigation actions here are collecting seeds and then encouraging tribal members to, to grow the berries themselves, to start um, berry gardens so that these berries are accessible and, and can be used for food and ceremony and, and things of that like. And another um, unique mitigation strategy uh, that was mentioned is the Confederated Tribes of the Umatia Indian Reservations First Food Program. And so, um, you know, kind of looking to that program um, for, what, for what it has accomplished and implementing some of those practices within, within the tribe. So going on to um, medicine herbs, um, you know, the, so elders within this community have knowledge about the medicine plants and, and still harvest these medicines. And um, 
on page 26, it, it lists those medicines. And I think, it's, you know, a way to connect this to, to some of the guidelines that Colleen was talking about is, you know, while these specific plants are mentioned um, in terms of risks, it's not mentioned where, right, or how to harvest them or things like that. So I think that's, that's something to be aware of um, throughout you know, while you're looking at this plan and, and trying to figure out how to integrate traditional knowledges into your own plan is, you know, while things can be mentioned um, to the general public, you don't have to get into, into the specifics because, you know, that information is sacred and, and not necessarily intended to be shared with just anybody. Um, and so for the medicine herbs, uh, building medicine gardens specifically uh, to harvest and, and cultivate, cultivate these specific herbs. And then I believe this is the last one, um, but the trees. And so within, for this tribe, for the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, the maple tree is, is a tree that they spoke about specifically. So they kind of got general about, you know, the, the trees in, at large um, within within their homelands, um, and then they had specific sections on the maple tree. And so, um, within the plan, it says that the leader of all the trees is the maple. It provides um, the first medicine food of the spring, which helps renew strength and reminds of the continual responsibility to take care of it. And the maple syrup is used as medicine drink and is also added. To, to their food. And so looking at mitigation action specifically for, for maples, um, you know, it's reducing competition with other, with other trees within the area and thinking about things such as, you know, does it make sense to tap the trees earlier if uh, the trees are going through early, going through um, or receiving spring earlier in the season and, and considerations such as that. So um, yeah, this, this is a really beautiful plan to, to read. Um, and I think it gives you a good sense of, of one way in which to integrate traditional knowledges into a climate adaptation plan. And so, um, you know, we, we could share so many examples with y'all um, in terms of how different tribes are integrating traditional knowledges. And we want to kind of open this up to have you all have an opportunity to share what you're doing or that you want to do. Um, and I understand not everyone here is um, coming from um, an indigenous or tribal background, and, and that's okay. Um, maybe you're working with the tribe, um, maybe you're doing consulting work. Um, there's a reason you're here. And so we really want to hear from you, you know, what are strategies that you have heard? What are plans that have stuck out to you? And, and, and what are you hoping to accomplish here? And so, yeah, feel free to, to unmute and, and share out or use the chat box to, to share your thoughts. We want to hear from you. Well, this is Tyler. I um, just want to say thank you, first of all, for sharing that plan. Um, it's, um, it's, it's always um, interesting to see all these, the different planning processes and how, again, how different they can each be and unique they can each be uh, for sure. Um, speak from, I'll speak from our experience. We, um, it was in 2016, we completed a climate change vulnerability assessment adaptation plan for the 1854 seeded territory. Um, for those not familiar, that's in uh, present day Northeast Minnesota. Um, and we did that in collaboration with Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, Grand Portage Band of Lakes Pier Chippewa, who are the, those are the two bands that we serve. Um, and then uh, also with the Fond du Lac Band of Lakes Pier Chippewa. And when we're developing that plan, we, we actually acknowledged at one of the early meetings um, that to really get um, 
community involvement and that knowledge into our plan, given our timeline, which in this case, we had a, a grant for just over a year um, to complete. Um, we knew that wasn't likely, wasn't possible, and that to do it right, it just wasn't feasible. So um, a lot of our strategies um, to, in order to implement is really to make those connections and um, to help, for, first of all, understand what and how things have changed um, because we only have so much information now, but to really get that local knowledge, you have to s sit and have conversations. And, um, and that's something we've, we know we need to do. We just haven't done it yet. We're trying to develop a process to do that. And, um, so I guess that's my experience and where we're at. It's, it's really our next step to implementing some of our, uh, actually quite a few of our strategies from our plan. Mm-hmm. Great. Thanks so much, Tyler. Really appreciate your input there. Yeah. So um, one question I have for you, did I catch that the plan that you put together has is for is for a few different tribes? Um, yes. Okay. Yep. Um, so we've, it was with uh, an equal partnership, we've we developed, um, it, we were working with Boys Fort, Grand Portage and Fond du Lac bands. Um, mm -hmm. So there's four of us as project partners um, and, and with that effort we actually um, received money uh, funding through the Bureau of Indian Affairs to hire contractor assistance mm -hmm. um, and that was Adaptation International and they subcontracted Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments so GLISA mm -hmm. and um, really they brought in the climate information we really didn't have or the climate science um, they've facilitated meetings, brought in a process to develop a plan. Um, the Grand Portage Band actually had, they did theirs in-house and they were near completion at the time of a plan for their, just the Grand Portage Reservation. Um, so we're able to actually grab quite a bit from that, but um, we wanted to make sure that it was still our plan um, between us and our partners. Um, so we, you know, we brought in the assistance to make sure we were still steering the direction of the plan and, you know, fully uh, in charge of what goes into the plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the contractors are great to work with. Um, but, um, but again, they were also part of those conversations uh, where we're talking about that we can't, we really didn't think it was a feasible thing to have really, given our timeline, um, we weren't knew we weren't be able to get, get those conversations going with community members, but mm -hmm. um, we were able to draw some information from previous surveys um, that were because uh, we had surveys that we sent out for Grand Porridge and Boys Fort. Um, Fond du Lac had their own surveys for their band members, and we we're able to between that and our management priorities, which are for us, it's driven by our board of directors, which is the council members from Boys Fort and Grand Portage. Um, we, it's not like we didn't have any direction or idea of what's important or what we should be doing, but mm -hmm. a lot of it tied in with the current work we're doing. And then it's trying to fill in the gaps of what don't we understand and how do we get that? But um, a big part of that was sitting down and um, again, having, reaching out to the community and trying to figure out how things change, where, what, where is important. And we know, like was mentioned before, there's sensitivity with that too. So how do you go about that? And hmm. one idea we threw out um, and we're still, we're actually going to be looking into, but we'll see where it goes. Um, having some, it's not like we don't have any connection by, I'm not trying to say that, but we're trying to reach out to maybe are the contacts that we usually the community members that we do um have more communication with a better connection with and talk about maybe having kind of a committee um on each for each on each of the for each of the bands that we reach out to with the type of information we would you know like to get um and to be able to and maybe have them make the connections and reach out in a proper way. And then we can have a communication with them about what they find and they can tell us what's appropriate to share and what's not. Mm -hmm. That was one thing that we talked about doing. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, so yeah, I guess that's maybe I ran on a little bit there, but that's, that again, that's kind of our experience where we're at with things. Great. No, it's so interesting to to hear your experience, and um, you know, just this is a really Tyler. It sounds like. Um, the, the tribe that you're working with, you know, it's a very different process, right? There's multiple tribes in the mix and, and how do you balance, uh, you know, what Colleen was talking about earlier that there's not just one set of traditional or indigenous knowledges, you're balancing multiple, right? In a singular plan. And so, um, yeah, it sounds like really, really great work and, and also challenging to figure out you know, how, how to actively engage uh, the community um, in a way that, that uplifts all, all of these different tribes' voices. So yes, thanks for sharing that. Um, and it looks like we have, uh, Stefan, thanks for your question in the chat. Um, Stefan is asking, um, you know, what are the best practices for protecting information that should be safeguarded? Um, but still being able to use it internally across departments. Uh, do some nations have protocols for this and do protocols need to be developed? And so I think Nikki's going to take this, this question for us here. Yeah, before I answer uh, Stefan's question, I wanted to mention that in the chat box, uh, we like to brag about Tyler and the 1854 Treaty Authority. It's a great example of collaboration. It's a great example of um, how you work on ancestral territories um, for, for tribes. It's really important to them for hunting, for su subsistence purposes, right? So uh, read that, read that um, example. But I also put it um, a link in there that they were featured as one of the tribal adaptation plans that was featured in the National Fish, Wildlife, and Plants, their the latest climate adaptation strategy. But also on page 32, there's um, a, a small section on including indigenous knowledges um, in fish, wildlife, and plants uh, in climate adaptation planning and action. So that's a really good one, um, not just because my name is in there, but um, it's uh, it's actually um, a plan that uh, a strategy that was updated to specifically include indigenous knowledges and they did a webinar on it um, and uh, it's up there Rachel Novak from the BIA gave a really good synopsis of the indigenous knowledges section so thank you Tyler that's really interesting I'll have to touch base with you soon about uh, your next steps and what you're doing um, so uh, Stefan, thank you for that question. Um, I would first refer people back to Colleen's presentation on the guidelines for considering guidelines for considering traditional knowledges and climate change initiatives. Um, if you have been saying that as long as I have, you will say it in your sleep. It's a mouthful, but it's a really good um, set of guidelines there's eight of them as you saw and it really shows you that the remember what i said that the knowledge belongs to the people and they get to say um this is mine this is ours we don't want this information to be um to be shared outside the the the, the project you know or the community and whatnot so they kind of yeah and it's also respectful for us to say you uh what 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 would you not like shared in publications public presentations um anything like that so we have to be really uh conscious of that many tribal nations indigenous um nations have tribal councils leadership that often have to go through it uh you know the process of um, uh, what do you call it, uh, saying yes to a project um, and then, or saying no to a project uh, that's coming in and wanting to talk with people about traditional indigenous knowledges, whether that be for with plants, um, animals, or just human subjects. Um, Navajo Nation and then some other tribes, I just keep saying Navajo Nation because they have one of the biggest institutional review board um, committees um, that I know about. I personally went through it and it's pretty rigorous. Um, like any academic institution, they should have an IRB, Institutional Review Board, um, 
departments or folks that make sure that human subjects are protected. But also, as I mentioned, the Yurok tribe, they have the cultural committee that that they, things have to go through before they even make it outside of a conversation about a project. Um, I think the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribe might have one also. So they have, they're, they're, they're set in place and you should be asking if tribal and indigenous nations have these committees to protect that information specifically. So um, yes, uh, and then to answer your last question, a lot of these protocols still need to be developed and they need to be strict. I know that the Navajo Nation and the Hopi Nation, they're super strict. Hopi Nation, the Hopi tribe, if you wanna work with their people, you have to talk to their lawyers and then you have to talk to the village leaders all there's not one leader for all the villages combined they each have their own little government so it gets complicated um, as you go from village to village and whatnot so that's a really good question and colin or kelsey or stefan even speak up um, if you are anybody else speak up if you know of anything else that i did not include in um, that answer so it's a really good question that we should all be thoughtful when we're working with indigenous communities that information does not belong to you or the university or the organization, it belongs to the people themselves. And I really quick want to use an example. I worked with the Cherokee, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And when I interviewed um, their tribal elders on fire uses, I spent three summers with them and I use a tape recorder. Um, I wrote I wrote notes, piles and piles of notebooks. But after I was done, I my very first copy of my thesis, all the recordings and all the notebooks went back to them. I don't I don't I, don't, I didn't keep any of it. Um, I remember all the notes by by, you know, by heart. I spent so much time with them. I said that 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 stuff is yours. Um, because I made the mistake of saying in the beginning, I want to do research with your tribe and some lady literally chewed me out and I deserved it because I didn't approach it respectfully and um, and I, I found a way in, um, but it took some time um, and whatnot. So with that, I, I'll, I'll pass the floor to somebody else who wants to ask a question or share their own experience of incorporating traditional knowledge. So please, we want to hear from you. What do you think? Are you uncomfortable? Are you all about it? What, what's going on? I want to, we want to hear what you're thinking. Hey, this is Stefan. Yeah, I, I was going to wait and see if anybody else wanted to chime in first, but thank you for answering that question, Nikki. And I, I think that's something that we talk about a lot in climate adaptation, and it's something that is incredibly important, but is another one of those issues that just depends on each tribal nation and their internal processes. And I think the question that you really did a good job of focusing on was the two layers of that. So one being external partners and how they partner with tribes, how external researchers work and follow existing protocols or try to identify the best practices for following um, ways to engage with tribal departments. And then I think the other layer is the working across departments and trying to figure out how do different departments work together? Because I think in, increasingly that's something that is important in climate adaptation and that we advocate for, but also something that isn't done in general and largely because of how siloed many departments are. But that information sharing is really helpful and important and reduces a lot of extra work that happens. And so figuring out ways to share across departments, I think is something that has to be worked out. And obviously each tribe is different. Some do it better than others. And, um, but I think a lot of really important conversations are coming out of this presentation to talk about those issues. So thank you, uh, Nikki and Colleen and Kelsey for such a great uh, presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Stefan. Really appreciate uh, appreciate your input here. Um, let's see. If we don't have anyone else who is hoping to share or anything like that, um, I think we can go on. Um, 
and start to, to wrap this session up. Um, so I, I'm not sure if others attended sessions yesterday. Uh, we definitely forgot to share this during our session yesterday, but we really appreciate your feedback and the conference as a whole is hoping to, to have a lot of feedback. And so um, Colleen, maybe you could throw the session survey link in the chat box, but for each session there, there's an evaluation. And so the moderators should be sharing that with you. And if you could take a few minutes and, and fill that out, that would be very much appreciated uh, moving forward. And yeah, just, just trying to improve the conference and in our presentations and uh, just seeing what is valuable to y'all and what you're hoping to hear more about. Yeah, and then with that, um, just just concluding concluding our presentation here. Uh, all of our contact info is on this last slide. If if you have any questions or think of anything, um, want to connect, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Karen Cazetto is one of our co-managers who's not with us today, uh, but her and Nikki are are one uh, powerhouse of a team. So. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us. We'd love to hear from you. And yeah, Colleen, do you have any? Do you have anything else that? Okay. Well, thanks so much, everyone. And hopefully, this gives you a little break before the afternoon sessions. Uh, we definitely encourage you to um, to attend some of those. I'm moderating a session here soon uh, called the Emerging Leaders Session. And I believe Nikki jumped off. She's also moderating a session. And then I think there's a third one. Um, so definitely check out the sessions this afternoon. And we appreciate you for being here today. Thanks so much. <laughs>